we are live from kitchen to kacheri at the exhibition in iic we have with us professor suni vadwa will be talking to us about her project on archiving sindhi literature over to you thank you ishita very very great to be here and uh, very grateful that you guys are also here to look at the books and to uh, make sense of whatever we have here with us so i'm soni vadwa i am a sindhi and for a very long time i thought it was a very bad thing <laughs> because uh, you know in uh, in when it came to in, you know history of indian independence when it came to study of indian mm. english literature or indian literature in general i thought uh, there are no sindhi names that you come across and in terms of freedom fighters and uh, stuff and you don't you can't even name one great sindhi author right you can name bengali you can name hindi right you can name tons of uh, marathi some with gujarati right but sindhi i mean these people have no culture they are just here to make money or they are very shrewd businessmen and they don't understand anything beyond that so i thought okay that's that's how we are i am just this one odd person who is interested in literature and uh, you know wants to uh, do something with literature poetry fiction novels and stuff like that so that was my first uh, first notion of uh, who sindhi are a second notion came from uh, cinema where there would be some sort of uh, stereotypical statements made about sindhi very accent you know making fun of their accent also and i thought okay this is also me yeah and it's so uncool but it's okay i'm trying to be cool with it when i got married uh, to a bengali my uh, you know parents in law had a lot to share with me about their history about their legacy about where did they come from and stuff like that and uh, we had i had nothing to say i said okay fine i'm listening <laughs> nice to know that so all of this uh, you know had been piling up in somewhere in my head and giving me some sort of crisis and some sort of inferiority that uh, you know there were other communities or there were other kinds of beings along you know around which there was an aura there was some sort of sexiness black you know bengalis can be very glamorous right yeah <laughs> they can be so snooty they can be i mean they are uh, ladida about everything from cute to you know that or everyone thinks you know they own the world so that was one uh, one element and i thought okay i should i am i'm in a way an orphan of some sorts because uh, i do not have these kinds of lenses uh, to talk about because literally there would be nothing for me to speak a uh, some time back i also realized that whatever we read in terms of high literary theory is also something that ends in books itself so there is this gujarati uh, theorist called g n devi ganesh devi who talks about amnesia his uh, which means that you know uh, we have forgotten whatever happened before the british uh, you know period in our history so we do not know how to connect with our medieval history we do not know how to connect with our ancient history whatever the british taught us we have lived with that and our post colonial legacy also continues to build on that itself so there is a very huge amnesia that we are going through and i thought okay that might be true about and bengalis and stuff like that about all sorts of other cultures and uh, as usual i thought it was something that applies to other communities also because well we have nothing right uh, in that context uh, again that sort of element stayed with me and someone my mphil research supervisor encouraged me to work on sindhi literature partition writing so that's how i got into translated writing i you know looked at a volume of poetry i looked at a you know selection of short stories translated books then i came up with a, a small dissertation and again i thought that particular chapter is uh, you know set aside and it's fine and uh, so that will be the end of it uh then uh, slowly and slowly i began to think well you know those were two or three books that i studied but if i could read the sindhi script for myself i can speak i can understand very well but i cannot uh, i could not read and write at that point of time so i thought if i can think about it myself i mean if i can read the books myself that would be a great idea so that's how i got a primer at a very very you know, old stage of life and it was very embarrassing when you know other school students the last of the school students who were uh, learning in sindhi medium schools okay and uh, they were the ones who had read it or studied it at a very very different age and i was looking at it uh, what in my 
twenties and they were laughing at me. So I've been through all of those kinds of you know elements. And, uh, this is the bridal, and uh, they don't even have the decency to <laughs> mind it properly and you know uh, arrange it properly so that it looks like a bridal. Right? So it's a very thin book. It's actually papers that has been you know stapled together. And I thought, wow, it's a fun thing to have. I had another one which was smaller than this, and I began to read from here. So the one fun fact that I understood it's very painful to read or understand because while English has 26 letters, Hindi has 52. Okay, and uh, I thought, okay, it's going to be quite a struggle. And while there are vowels and consonants marked very well in Hindi and English and everything else, here the case was slightly different. So verb. Works as Uki Matra and Oki Matra also, and year works as Eki Matra and Eki Matra also. So you would go bananas thinking about what is it that I'm reading, right? So this was one angle uh, I was looking at. And I thought, okay, it, it was still very, very difficult for me to put these things together. And I was looking for someone to help me read faster. Okay? And I bumped into a lady who was willing to help me, of course. But she also said, would you take my father's books, my late father's books? And those are the books that will, you know, that might help you. So I thought, okay, there might be, you know, one or two books that uh, I would like to read. And, you know, it will just increase my speed in, uh, you know, Sindhi. And I thought, wow, okay. Uh, but with her, I read my first book of uh, children's shops, you know, children's stories. And you will find, okay, it's breaking, but I'll still show you. I have, you know, underlying stuff here in these books because I, there were certain words that I couldn't figure out. So she used to sit with me and help me read. And, uh, you know, it, the book started coming apart even further. And I thought, okay, uh, there is no way I'm going to read this, you know, in my life. And by the time I finish one book, I will be, you know, uh, my grandmother's age. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll you know, still manage to keep it. Uh, and I thought initially she would give me just 10 15 books. I got talking to her because I was reading my cousin's 9th standard, 10th standard Sydney books. Okay. And then I thought, uh, yeah, okay. Now that she's given me one book, it's fine, I'll read it. There will be four, five more books and stuff. But there were 200 of them at least. And I had a huge box, I mean, uh, this much tall, it was it was my computers, the desktop computers box, it was huge. And uh, for many months it was every the entire collection was lying there because I did not know what to do. So there would be white ants coming out of it, there would be all kinds of other things coming out of it and I thought I should do something about it. So I got hold of this friend and uh, who works with the uh, Wikimedia Foundation. He helped me send back all the books and you know he took them uh, to Servants of Knowledge Group based in Mysore and they have archived uh, these books and they are now up on archive.org where you find most public domain books. Right? So most of those books are there. But I kept some of them with me as a token of you know uh, my inability to read as a reminder. As I pick up these books, these things keep falling. Out. So uh, this guy, Ram Panjwani, is known to be one of the great philanthropists of Bombay city. He's the one who set up a college, which is a very, very elite college in Bombay. And uh, I thought I should keep this book, maybe translate it at some, you know, on, uh, at some level. And uh, as I was beginning to read, I found uh, that while I can read, I don't have all the resources to read. So I bumped into this. Which is well falling. So uh, this is my most cherished item, and uh, I've been keeping it. I've been trying not to refer to it because it means opening it. <laughs> so I got it very excitedly, but uh, nothing much came out of it. But you know, with it, which with the digitization, it, something might have happen to it. These are. Uh, Four volumes of uh, great Sindhi short stories since partition. This is one, two, three, and four. So someone bothered to digitize them and uh, said, let's, uh, no, as in compile them. And I thought, okay, 
let's read. Sindhi short story is the is one of the genres that uh, flourished after independence here. So that is how I thought of maybe someday picking them up, translating them, and seeing that you know whenever you go to a bookstore, even today morning when I went to the bookstore, there was a collection. Greatest stories ever told, greatest Tamil stories ever told, and I always miss Sindhi there. So maybe if I can manage to do this, it will be a great idea. And uh, uh, people will get to read and maybe decide for themselves whether Sindhi, whether there was such a thing as Sindhi literature. Because uh, I realized that you know, like you hear about Bombay, like you hear about Calcutta, you hear about Delhi, you do not hear of stories that are small pockets of uh, you know Sindhi settlements. So I'm from a little outside Ulasnagar, uh, Bombay, which is Ulasnagar, a small town, and uh, which is again notorious for all kinds of wrong reasons, right? It's called the USA. <laughs> it's also called a place where all kinds of fake goods are, you know, uh, made available. And they say, in fact, the joke is that whenever you hear people at the roadside signals selling things, China Gamal system, China Gamal system, it's all from Ulasnagar. Don't believe that it's from China. <laughs> so that was that was one element and. Uh, I thought, you know, these locations where I've grown up, these things that have been part of my childhood, and Ulasnagar is a very, very renowned settlement that way, or a notorious settlement that way, these things don't matter as if, you know, my entire past is not matter. So, even things like uh, food, we are, we are very, we have a very different kind of food tradition, which my, you know, non sindhi friends wouldn't understand. They would say, like, you know, why do Sindhis not like food? Like, why are they after snacks? <laughs> or why are they, you know, such great chart eaters? Or why are they eaters of things that don't even make sense as food? So, all of that was like, okay, whatever things I understand as food do not probably exist. And they are not even worth calling food. So, with a friend of mine who was here on the opening day, I began to edit a volume on Karachi Ki Kahani. So, these were stories about scholarly articles about Karachi. And in the process of going through memoirs and all of those things, I came across words that uh, I've never seen in books or read in books. So there were there would be references to food items, there would be references to you know locations like Siru Chok. Siru Chok is a chalk in Ulasnagar, but you know it's not related anywhere else. Like the way Kalagola, Marine Drive, right? Kudum Mina, these kind of places that get reflected. So I, I was very happy, I was very overjoyed to read of such a location. I was over to read of Thairi. Thairi is a dish that is uh, that Sindhis make and they I don't know. But it's a very important dish. It's, it's a very important part of Prashad and things like that. So uh, it was something that uh, I read about in those stories and just imagine someone mentioning these when writing about Karachi. So I went all the way back and then I thought, okay, I, I must have I mean, I should work towards, you know, preserving all this food all of this to a greater extent because otherwise the only access we will have today is in the form of translation um, very very good book to come in the recent times unfortunately it was not translated when i was doing my uh, m2 dissertation so it came a little after that so we may not have all of this very soon because uh, and this is the bigger safer dictionary that I can refer to. Uh, so we will not have access to all of this. That generation is passing away. The people who can read the script are passing away. There has been a controversy around the script as well. For example, many people, I mean, uh, someone, one, someone in uh, 1960s started saying that if you want Sindhi to survive in India, what you should do is uh, move to Devanagari script. This is not the Devanagari script. This is the Arabo Persian script. So, uh, that movement started and we are still divided along the science. Science Academy is waiting for our decision regarding what to do and what not to do. And uh, we are trying our best to see um, whether we are able to take a stand or not. Yesterday I was at Delhi's Sindhi Academy and saw quite a few books there and there, the first, at their own level, they are trying to publish in Desanti the as well as Arabic version. But let's see uh, what we decide at the whether we decide anything at all, right? So um, this is this is it. So my attempt to show all this to bring into Ishita's forum is uh, that someday uh, I'll be able to that uh, Sajman and uh, with him I'll be able to come up with a Sindhu foundation in which I will be able to digitize everything and in fact even offer scholarships and stipends to people. 
uh, translate these works, to study these works, to conduct research, do a little more beyond the work. Picking up just very selected versions because if there are books written about Ulasnagar, they you know deserve to be out. A lot of people over there have some sort of complex. They want to go out, even if they don't. They want to step out. Anyone who has uh, any little bit of brain wants to step out of Ulasnagar and you know move towards Bombay. That's because there is nothing associated with any identity over there. So with that spirit, uh, I want to be able to take this to people and say. Well, I encourage this and see if uh, you know, put me in touch with other archivists who might be interested in doing something like this. See if there are any other funding organizations or even private collections. They might be thinking they must be having some funding. Even if they can come forward and you know let their books be digitized, that can uh, happen. So this was it. I wanted to show this much and uh, thank you for listening. Do you want to tell us about how you found these books and the story of the floods which you shared with us? Ah, right, right. So what I, one of the stories, uh, one of the reasons why I was motivated to collect this was uh, my college in Ulasnagar. It was destroyed in 2005, uh, floods in Mumbai. So the, the library was on the ground floor and all of it was just, the water reached up to the first floor. So it was that bad and all of these kinds of books just vanished. And uh, therefore, I mean, it was one of the richest sources of Sindhi literature. Like you could have named the book and you know, you would have found it over there. So that sort of disappeared and I thought, uh, how many more such collections are waiting to just, you know, vanish? And that was one. And um, how I found these books was there was an auntie who was trying to help me at a park in Mumbai who was uh, helping me, who saw me struggle with, you know, reading all this, uh, reading the script. And uh, she said, well, you should be, I mean, since you are interested in reading, I think you will like to have my father's books. You don't know what to do with them. He was a maths tuition teacher. So she had a lot of maths books and very advanced books for that level, for that age. And what she did was, I mean, there were many sort of takers for maths books, but nobody, nobody wanted to send me books. So I bought these books from her and I began. It is, I mean, I think all these books are also stamped with this name. You will be able to see them. This is uh, Parmanand Shamdas. And you know why that reminded me? This man was such an avid collector of books. Uh, it is not just for nothing. A lot of these books have some sort of uh, uh, appeal, advertising appeal uh, around them. In fact, one of them, these are general ads but uh, one of these uh, books also had an ad about uh, buy as many books as you can this is an appeal to readers buy as many books as you can about Sindhi is not just for that author uh, because the language will die the author will of course die without that support but uh, every household should have a Sindhi library that was the ambition and I thought these books are of great interest not just in terms of the society that it was but in terms of uh, economics of its time, publishing industry of its time. So I thought I would be very happy to have Thank you so much for giving us this context. And thank you for inviting me. Before I ask questions, anyone, if you have any questions or thoughts, reactions? ये third या fourth generation है हमारा और ये आते आते almost जितने भी पुराने languages हैं Urdu है, Sindhi language है और भी बहुत सारी भी जो languages वो धीरे-धीरे vanish होता जा रही है like youngsters interest नहीं लेते या कहीं ना कहीं कुछ चीजें भी सो रही हैं जो education system है या upbringing जो घर में जैसे हम grow कर रहे हैं वहाँ पे कुछ कल्चर mix होता जा रहा है mix होता जा रहा है of course, तभी तो कोशिश भी यही होनी चाहिए कि जितना हो सके हम हमारे बुजुर्गों से कनेक्ट करें और पूछें कि के उस टाइम क्या हुआ था या आपकी लाइफ कैसी रही है यहाँ पर अपना या पहले कैसे थी तो उस कॉन्टेक्स्ट में मुझे लगता है कि बेकारी या उसी के कॉन्टेक्स्ट में या बाजार के कॉन्टेक्स्ट में थोड़ा बहुत काम हो रहा है
The other thing is, मैंने कभी मेरे दादाजी नानाजी से कभी पार्टीशन के बारे में बात नहीं की। मेरे ग्रैंडफादर आठ साल के थे जब क्लास में आए थे। तो उस वक्त इतना ही पता है बस, और कुछ पता नहीं। That's just the fact. So, even I have not dared to talk to him. वो शायद स्टोरी भाग जाएगी तो वो हो जाएगी या फिर उन्होंने अगर अपने बेटों को कुछ बताया होगा तो वो शायद बाद में मेरे पास आएंगे पर इट्स इट्स नॉट अ स्पेस वेयर यू टॉक अबाउट ऑल ऑफ दिस थिंग्स विद योर पेरेंट्स दे वांट टू फॉरगेट इट आई आई न्यू ऑफ समवन हु हुज फैमिली स्पेंड थ्री इयर्स एट अ रेलवे स्टेशन बिफोर दे कुड फाइंड राइट सो वेयर आर दीस स्टोरीज आई एम श्योर देयर विल बी ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ दीस स्टोरीज हियर and actually no one can see so digitization is first step after that if we can you know get them transcribed if we can get them you know then uh, you know if we can make it available in other languages it becomes easier for people to search also to understand at least people like me who can speak can read the manuscript or figure out other solutions to remain in touch but aap kya kehte hain sir जनरेशन का भी कहना कहीं एक एक लेने का स्टेप बैक रहा है आजकल चीजें इतनी सारी हैं सबसे पहले तो ये ऑलमोस्ट इस चीज पे सब कुछ हो जाता है तो बहुत सारी चीजों के बीच में रहना और फिर खो जाने वाला भी एक बात है बहुत बड़ी जो ये सब चीजों को या तो हम छोड़ते जा रहे हैं मिस करते जा रहे हैं तो यहाँ पे मेरे को ऐसा लगता है हमारा भी एक टेक होना चाहिए उस चीज़ को आगे फॉरवर्ड करने के लिए और वो जानना बहुत ज़रूरी है हम कहाँ से आए हैं हम कैसे आए हैं और अभी जो लाइफ हमें मिली है या जो हम जी रहे हैं वो किन किन चीज़ों से होके नहीं मिले पूरी फैमिली है जनरेशन एक के बाद एक के बाद एक और इतना टाइम अभी हुआ नहीं है ज़्यादा कि हम इतनी जल्दी ये सारी चीज़ें भूल जाएँ या उनको रखें ना ठीक से तो मेरे को ऐसा लगता है कि सबके तरफ से टेक होना चाहिए कि ये जनरेशन को संभालना चाहिए और और आगे के लिए फॉरवर्ड करने के लिए रखना चाहिए जो तो बहुत जल्दी ऐसी चीज़ें होते जा रही हैं कोरोना के टाइम तो बहुत एक्सीडेंटल है ये जो जिस तरीके से आया और एकदम से बहुत सारे ऐसे लोग हैं जो अब नहीं है हमारे पास उनकी बहुत सारी स्टोरीज हैं बहुत सारी चीज़ें हैं जो उन्हीं के साथ चली गई या जिनको मिला तो वो बहुत थोड़ा मिला और उनको इस टाइम पर ये रियलाइज हुआ कि क्योंकि वो टाइम ही ऐसा था सब लोग घर के अंदर हैं तो घर के अंदर ही चीज़ें सोच रहे हैं चीज़ें हो रही है कुछ लोगों ने टेक लिया फिर वहाँ पर भी चीज़ें हाथ से निकलती जा रही है तो उन्होंने क्या किया उन्होंने ऑब्जेक्ट्स को लेकर स्टडी की है पार्टीशन के टाइम पे लोग अगर कहीं पे कुछ अपने साथ लेकर आए थे तो आई थिंक ऐसे इक्कीस स्टोरीज हैं जहाँ पे वो ऑब्जेक्ट के ऊपर फोकस कर रही है और बता रही है मतलब जो भी फैमिली मेंबर है वो लेगेसी बता रहे हैं उस स्टोरी की प्याले हैं तलवार कहते हैं ऐसे छोटी छोटी चीजें हैं सारी है तो ये कोशिश नहीं तो नरेट स्टोरीज तो ऑब्जेक्ट्स दैट्स दैट्स वन पॉसिबिलिटी अगर लोग हैं स्टोरीज आर ऑफ कोर्स दैट ऑब्जेक्ट्स वुड आल्सो वन इंटरेस्टिंग वे टू दिस पार्टीशन म्यूजियम आल्सो जिसके बारे में आई थिंक आलू वालिया ने भी लिखा है बट दैट दोस आर दोस आर नेट One of the trick questions in archiving, <clears throat> which is very relevant to your project, has been about translation, the word itself and the action of translation. It's important because you want to make things accessible. But we know that. very famous phrase lost in translation and also your journey itself talks about you saw something missing in the translations and hence you wanted to look at the originals and then you come back to translation as a method of preservation yeah how do you address this cyclic process or or this in and out of having a leg in both the boots especially because you are a professor of english yourself as a language how do we deal with this then i think that is why i just don't want to translate but also digitize so that it's available for everyone 
everyone to read it for themselves also. Mm. So that is why it should be accessible in a technical sense to everyone. But at the same point of time, if there are more and more people who want to learn, that's why it's about building a community mm. of researchers, of translators, of scholars, mm. of people who would want to, you know, as digital humanists also help. Convert from one form to the other so that it begins to make sense. How about looking at the same thing, same text from the point of view of a digital interactive text? So I'm very conscious of these things. I'm also very nervous about these things, but let's see where these things take me. And so far, I've only translated two excerpts, mm. but uh, there is huge. I mean, it, it's something that you cannot approach on its own. You need a lot of people. You need listening, you need podcasting, you need uh, all of these other elements which can make it reach other people. There is a uh, peculiar problem with Sindhi. Uh, even Sindhi texts which are available in libraries and personal collections. Even they have to be translated into another script because the community has lost uh, touch with the script. And actually, there is a fund uh, established by the British Library, which is called Endangered Archives Program. Hmm. So, I think this is high time that Sindhi. Uh, Print publications should be first of all saved mm-hmm. in electronic form, and they support these things. But they, if you identify archives, so they will uh, give you enough funds to digitize uh, and catalog. Uh, so many Tamil uh, archives have been saved. Um, there have been projects for saving uh, Urdu projects. So everything else comes later. Because uh, there is so much available uh, in uh, in Sindhi publications. Because uh, they have been complemented everything. And uh, when Sindhi publications started in Around 1851, mm. the Lithop Presses in uh, several uh, small towns and cities of Karachi, in Karachi, Hyderabad, Sakhar, Jaikubabad, Chikarpur. So they have been, uh, they have been a very uh, they have been very keen to document everything mm. from the beginning of uh, printing in the subcontinent. So, uh, I mean, of course, people are passing away who belong to that generation. Many of them are gone. But even this, then he had to move to Agra and he started it from Agra. And then he came to after a brief stay in Delhi, he moved to Ahmedabad. The fourth genome of that uh, Sindhu is from Ahmedabad. So I came across an anthology of uh, articles published in those in, in the copies that survived. And uh, it's full of such gems so, which are there. And, uh, I uh, saw it in the uh, Sindhi Academy of Delhi and uh, I don't think there was a single person in that whole academy who could read <laughs> because the uh, script has changed and uh, many people of the younger generation have lost the language itself they cannot even converse so this has been a very uh, sad story. 
and the beginning has to be made by by saving all the material. Part one, part two, destroy. Whatever is there can make the whole complete story. So, just a few days back, we were reading this book called Memory and Culture by Astrid Lindgren, and there was this concept called traumatic memory, which was talked about how generations pass on their whatever they've been through uh, to their children, and they pass it on, and and like the recent generation, they they feel that trauma without actually having experienced it, say uh, Holocaust survivors, so they pass on their stories and all that, and now uh, their children and their children now they go to concentration camps, and uh, being in those spaces gives them a feeling of trauma because of whatever has been passed on. Yeah, so uh, you had mentioned that uh, in your case, your grandparents. Uh, they not want to share it because they want to forget it. Uh, that just makes me wonder if the silence itself is kind of passing on trauma and some other things. Very difficult question. In fact, I can add to that because one of the things that uh, we spoke about um, when we were even curating this exhibit with, with one or two participants was about the agency of the dead. I still don't have more to develop on this, but I think I'm just extending the question that when we say we should preserve, who had created it? Did they want it to be preserved? And I'm borrowing it from another project where I'm building oral histories about women um, architects and practitioners from Indian post-independence history. And one just took it as a responsibility that because she's no more, I should talk to her family and friends. And it's very evident that the story which I'm getting or the way it is being narrated would be very, is very different than the way she would have portrayed it. Just the, just the voice of it. Then of course the details can be compared and dif can differ. So do we worry about the agency of who is not present? when we, especially when we are trying to evoke difficult emotions, experiences, pasts. I think we should worry about the dangerous consequences that silence and uh, these other kind of things can come. I have a colleague who had uh, worked on the way cities remember 1992, 1993. They reverse the sequence in which uh, events happen. So they think uh, bomb blasts happen first and then uh, the you know, musket was uh, demolished. So all of these things are hmm. because you know, probably people just passed on silence and did not give context to that silence. It began to have these kinds of repercussions and this kind of consequences where it can be you know twisted and turned in any way and uh, it becomes awful uh, with, with passing on of silence silence may not be uh, you know silence is wonderful in several ways but it may not be a good thing when it comes to talking about trauma i think it often leads to assumptions yes. assumptions but also i think uh, if i'm correct what you're insinuating also is misinterpretations and miscommunication of situations and we know it all that a lot more now when we're living it happening every day with kind of information that floats around so i hope texts themselves will be able to help understand the silence and what do you think he's read more than i ever read we run different situations in the No, in the context of Sindhi. No, but as I said, Sindhis have been a very literate uh, community. 
to uh, I mean, they are maybe they are silent uh, with the families. I don't want to talk about that situation which the children cannot uh, share. But they don't want to bring this painful memory. But uh, and the few memories also because that whole territory is gone and that situation is gone mm -hmm. and the, that generation uh, is in a totally different situation. Yes. And especially when they are scattered all over the place. Mm -hmm. So they have to deal with uh, different contexts and different uh, at a different place. So that silence is uh, I don't know. It's a survival strategy. But uh, whatever they have recorded in their memoirs, in fiction, and, uh, and journalism, so these things can make a good start. Because I don't think that uh, it has gone completely. And uh, you know, one thing would be the, the real tragedy could be if you trace these uh, publications, mm. series of publications, which started, for example, in Hyderabad, and they continued from Bangalore after that, so, with the same enthusiasm. But the effort dried up yeah. because they lost their readers. So from Hyderabad to Ajmer, from uh, Sakhar to Bombay, so they started off uh, with the same zeal. But when you lose your audience, then this is a kind of a forced silence because ah. your uh, your words cannot be read. And, uh, People around you lose their uh, touch with the script, then with the language. Then it becomes, a, I mean, they become uh, strangers to, uh, to the memory of those who came and those who caught it, give it to the pen and paper. Not that they have been silenced. Uh, the next generation actually became uh, indifferent or whatever. So they had to deal with other things. And if I was to speak for <laughs> the next generation, but also I'm talking about the changing times, it would be important to recognize the need for change of mediums or change of even relationships. So two things are coming to my mind when you're talking. A, yes, perhaps the the lesser interest in reading, but watching and listening, which has increased. And second, what I'm arriving at is, I am more interested in a certain history and I don't have to be from that community. Which also addresses the fact that it might be easier to talk to me because I'm an outsider, rather than what we were discussing, passing on the trauma as a lineage. So these change of times and hence response of that that understanding into archiving and preserving something. Do you think that is that would help, or would you imagine that no, it has to grow within the Sindhi community only? So with translation, the hope is that it reaches outside the country. After all, it was the it was the silence or it was the void around me that prompted me to think about all of these things because you if you know others also do not know of one author, others also do not know of you know one businessman or you know one freedom fighter. And if you are completely lost in do not have any way to connect on, on the national scene or in terms of popular culture, if you don't have anything, how would you you know reach out to others? Yes. So yes, it could start from the community, 
people who cannot, I mean, not all of it can be uh, translated or written about, can at least be watched and heard. Yes. Imagine uh, someone making uh, a movie on a novel that I've come to like, which is about a love story set in Ugasar. Yeah. And when I was doing a small excerpt from a very different uh, book, uh, the publisher was not ready to do it because he said first you have to get the author's approval or the publisher's approval. Now I couldn't raise either. And whatever one contact I managed, that person said, one and I'm like a local sneaker. This kind of situation. <laughs> This is where legal comes into picture, of course. I mean, I know it's a very different trajectory, but the law needs to be more enabling when we want to work with history and copyrights. Now, I mean, I have many questions about it. How does law enable us to work with histories in a, in a more constructive manner? So that these hurdles... Um, and I'm also, I think, holding myself back from saying because we are live. <laughs> yeah. I'm just being very honest. Yes, <laughs> I'm being very honest. <laughs> Too many organizers over here are <laughs> subject to what I might have to say. <laughs> but yes, I mean, we have been working with legal policies and understanding the Copyright Act and what it allows, doesn't allow, but also what we're seeing. Otherwise, what happens to media and communication when law intervenes in the current situation? It's not enabling you to speak about different formats and different fronts. It stops you to say what is quote-unquote right. Isn't it? And then that's what we have felt even for archiving. That, oh, do you have permissions? And hence, your document needs to be at least 100 years old. I think there's a mark only after a certain age of the document so whoever is in possession is allowed to do something with it. So you wait for it to become almost obsolete. obsolete. Because that's what's happening to the books that you showed. They are already in titles. If you were to wait a few more years, you're already compromising its material integrity. And now I'm worried what happens to you know, someone tracing those books on archive.org and saying, Hey, it was my father's or it was somebody else's. How dare you give it for our dating? All of this might be perfectly possible. But a lot of, you know, these phone numbers which are there, mm -hmm. you know, even if I would have tried to contact, those phone numbers are also of a very different era. They were not reachable at yeah. all. So let's see what. No, but you're not in trouble. So archive.org is uh, open access, so it's okay. So till you're putting it in public access, it's still okay. And you're not doing anything to it. So you're not changing its form. So that way, it's it's not uh, it's not a defiance of the legal protocol. But what if you want to work with it? What we were talking about is making forms of it to make it accessible. That is restricted until it becomes old enough. Now, what is that old enough? That's what is the trouble. Thank you so much. I think this. I mean, listening to this conversation for the third time, I think, and it's just very inspiring. And I hope. This project grows and people who are listening or will listen to this video will reach out to you and this Sindhi literature archive shall initiate itself soon. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much.